Well, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. And I think I have a mic, so I don't need this mic. And we don't need both of them going. Um, so it's always a challenge to come here and uh, give a public lecture because I never know um, how much physics you know. This boy probably knows more than most of us. And, um, and uh, how much physics, what your interests are, and things like that. And also a challenge for me to say, what is it I want to talk about? Because I have to get to science education. So I have to start somewhere with physics and then end up with science education. So I have this gravity's pull on science learning. So let me start off with this. The Earth is round. Yes? Oh, okay, yeah. Yes, the Earth is round. Now, we were trying to decide in the United States when we were writing standards for the United States in uh, 1993. We were trying to write national standards. And we said, the Earth is round. We should teach that in third grade, in class three. And then the class one teacher, this class one, no, 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 I teach it in class one. We can teach the earth is round in class one. And we said, no, no, you can't. They said, no, no, I do, I, I'm successful. And we said, I don't think you're successful. And she said, no, no, no come to my class, I'll show you where I'm, succe you're, I'm successful. I said, okay, we'll go to her class. So we go to the class, and she says to the students, what is the shape of the earth? And they say, it's round. And see, we, we, they, first class, they can learn the Earth is round. And I said, can I ask them a question? She said, yes. I said, okay, round like what? And they said, like a chapati. <laughs> Flat and round. And she said, oh, I didn't know that. I will have to go back and teach them some more. I said, you can't do that in, in this. They're only six years old. They can't learn this. And she said, no, no, no. I, I can teach this. I can teach this. So she taught them, and she said, um, what is the shape of the earth? Round. And she said, like a melon, like a cricket ball, like a football. It's round. And then all the students learned that. And she said, come back to my class. I was able to teach in class one. So you go back to the class. And she says to the students, what is the shape of the earth? And the students all go, it's round. And then she says, round like what? And so a melon, a soccer ball, a cricket ball. And then I said, can I ask them a question? <laughs> and she said, of course. I said, where do the people live? And she said, right at the top. <laughs> This idea that the Earth is round is very, very difficult. We pretend it's such an easy idea, but it's a very difficult idea. I find it difficult to believe that the people in Australia are not upside down and falling <laughs> off. And I think if you think about it, you say, yeah, I have a little trouble with that also. But we pretend in school, no, 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 everybody can learn this. In first class, you can learn it. No. Maybe third class, maybe when they're eight years old, they can start to learn this. So the Earth goes around the sun. Yes? OK. The Earth goes around the sun. If we ask Americans, does the Earth go around the sun, or does the sun go around the Eighty percent get it correct. I, I wish I could say 100 percent. I don't know what it's like in India. We've done the survey in America. Eighty percent get it right. Only 49 percent know it takes one year. But then, if we say, how do you know? It drops down way below 5%. How do you know the Earth goes around the sun? What is your evidence the Earth goes around the sun? I know what most people's evidence is. My teacher told me. I saw it in the book. That must be the evidence. It's in the book. And I remember in fourth, in class four, I used to write, the sun goes, if I wrote the earth goes around the sun, I got a, a smiley face. If I wrote the, the earth, the sun goes around the earth, I had to do it over. That's how I know. That is not evidence. And yet, for most of us, oh, the earth goes around the sun, I know that. And if, you, and if you ask thinking people, like the people here, who don't know the evidence, we say, well, why do you think that? Some of them will say, I think we sent a spaceship up here and watched them go around. <laughs> but we never have. And we've known this for hundreds of years long before we had uh, the Indian Space Agency. <laughs> so how do we know this thing? How did we find it out? Speaks to 
physics, physics knowledge, but it also speaks to the nature of science, to the nature of science, to the nature of belief, to the question of the history and philosophy that we adopt. So let's start with Ptolemy. Ptolemy, a brilliant person, lives almost 2,000 years ago, and he said, I can figure this out. If I look at this sky, I know there are seven, seven important objects. There's the moon and the sun, and then there's also these planets. He didn't know they were planets. Wandering stars, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, seven. That's why we have seven days in the week. But what happens is he then says, and they all go around the Earth. Because it feels like they all go around the Earth. I wake up in the morning, I see the sun go this way, it goes across the sky. And when somebody says, no, 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 the Earth is moving, it's like, really? <laughs> then is that why we, the Earth moves, we get dizzy, and we keep making mistakes. I mean, is this, is what's, is this what's going on? So Ptolemy builds a system where you can calculate exactly where every planet will be. Every, he can calculate where every planet will be. And, and this is important for astrology, for people who believe wherever these planets are, that determines something about your life. Um, people still believe that. And it's OK to believe it for entertainment. It's not, you know, if my horoscope says, today you will meet somebody important, well, that's, that's good. I, I can look forward to this. If it says, don't go to work today, now it becomes dangerous. Um, but anyway, he has all these circles and circles, and it's a good theory because it can predict eclipses like the lunar eclipse we're going to have in a week. It can predict um, where the planets will be. And in fact, what was so nice was it's because it's in the heavens, everything is circles. Circles are so perfect. They're round. They're perfect. So it's in the heavens. But you have all of these circles made of celestial stuff, and they rub against each other. And when they rub against each other, they make a sound, a heavenly sound, a beautiful sound, the most beautiful music you could imagine, the music of the spheres. And only the most gifted, intelligent, and sensitive people can hear it. I can hear it. Can you? <laughs> and people would say, yes, I hear it also. <laughs> and so we had the music of the spheres. And then. 1,500 years later, 1,500 years, everybody is OK with Ptolemy. 1,500 years later, Copernicus comes and says, you know what? No, the sun is at the center. Now, if you put the sun at the center, Copernicus can do this with fewer circles. They're still using circles. It works better. It's easier. And he writes this down. And it's a good theory because observations are consistent. It can explain everything Ptolemy could explain. And it was simpler, fewer circles. Simpler is appealing to us. We like simple, less to remember. Now, of course, um, we then have Galileo. Galileo is living in Italy. He hears that there was a telescope discovered in Holland invented in Holland. You take some lenses or mirrors, and you can see things that are very far away. He says, I'm going to build one of those. He doesn't know how to build it the way they did in Holland. But just knowing that there's a way to build it, he said, oh, there's a way to build it. I never thought of that. I'm going to build one. And he does. He builds a telescope, and he looks at the moon. And he says, it's not perfect. It's ugly. It's round, but it has marks on it. And it's, 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 not, it's heavenly, but not pretty. This is a big, a big problem. And then he looks at Jupiter. And every night he writes down where he finds Jupiter. And, what, and he sees little tiny stars to the left and right in Jupiter. Every day they're different until he realizes, no, no, no. There are moons going around. We have a moon. There are moons going around Jupiter. And so his conclusion is that not all things go around the Earth. See, Ptolemy, everything goes around the Earth. Well, no, those go around Jupiter. So that's that first little wedge in the, we're at the center of the world. Everything is about me. 
it's still allowed to be about you because you're young. <laughs> now, of course, when, Copernic, when Galileo says the Earth goes around the sun, just like the planets go around Jupiter, you see, Galileo was very famous, very famous, all, and he was friends with the Pope, and, uh, you know, it was very... Other people who said the Earth goes around the sun, like Giordano Bruno, they burned him at the stake. They killed him. He said, oh, no, if, if you say it again, the Earth goes around the sun, we're going to kill you. He said, it does go around the sun, and they killed him. What would we die for? What convictions do we have that are so valuable for us that we would put our life at stake just to... Really, if my life's at stake and they say, does the earth go around the sun, the sun goes around, I'll say, the sun goes around the earth, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, I'm okay. But Bruno died. Now, Galileo said it, but he was too famous to get rid of. So they just threw him in prison for 14 years for saying it. And he was best friends with the Pope. 14 years prison, that was like the nice thing to do. So after that, intellectual thought in Italy, it's taking a nosedive. So all of a sudden, the intellectual thought moves from Italy over to Western Europe. And here's this guy, Tycho Bray, in Denmark. Tycho Bray was an interesting character because um, if you see pictures of him, he lost his nose in a duel, so it was replaced with like a gold nose, and you always see this gold nose on Tycho Bray. And he does these observations. He doesn't have a telescope. This is before Galileo. He doesn't have a telescope. So with his eyes, he looks at the stars, the planets, every single night and writes down where they are, every night. And he writes them down, and so he has these big protractors that he can swing on and do this to make his observations. His observations are so good, they're not off by more than one-fifteenth of a degree. Now, you all know this is 90 degrees, so that's 45 degrees, five, five degrees, one degree. A fifteenth of a degree, that's how good he was with his eyes. Now, he had a theory. Both the sun and the earth are at the center. Can't quite agree with it up yet. The earth is at the center of some things, and the sun is at the center of other things. Tycho Bray can take wonderful measurements. But what he can't do is he can't look at the numbers he has and make sense of them because he's not a mathematician. So along from Germany comes Johannes Kepler. Kepler is an incredible mathematician. And he wants to use Bray's data to see if he can understand what's going on. Now, there's a little bit of a personality clash. You see Tycho Bray, you know, loses their nose in a duel, gets drunk every day, parties a lot, eats a lot of food, and just, just uh, and makes these beautiful observations. Kepler, I don't drink, I don't play, I grew up in a monastery, I just want to do math. Can I look at your data? Sure, but let's have a drink, let's fool around, let's get to know one another. No, I just want the data. And that goes on, not for a day or two, but for months and months and months, until Kepler is, I'm leaving. At which point Bray realizes all his data will be for naught because there's nothing he can do with it. And he finally acquiesces and says, okay, Kepler, you can have my data. So Kepler starts trying to describe the paths around the sun mathematically with this wonderful data. And he gets the perfect circles. He gets it. It's, it's perfect. But when he draws the perfect circles, some of them are off by two-fifteenths of a degree. And he says, nope, nope. There is no way Bray would have been off by two-fifteenths. He's that good. I trust him that much. He could not have been off by two-fifteenths of a degree. I mean, we couldn't even notice two-fifteenths of a degree. So it's an incredible tribute of Kepler to Bray to say, no, nope, I'm wrong. I'm not wrong. I'm wrong because the data is right, and I must be wrong, not the data was wrong. And so he goes back to the math tables. He goes back to his desk to do a little more math because he's off by two fifteenths of a degree. So that takes him another 14 years of doing math. 14 years of doing math because he was off by what, an extra fifteenth of a degree. 
the persistence, the drive, the need to know. And then he comes up with three laws. And these are in the books. And the, book, the first law is that, no, it's not circles. It's ellipses, flattened circles. And the books all draw it this way, so you can see that it goes faster when it's close to the sun, slow when it's away from the sun. And if you take the radius cubed, take the radius, 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 radius cubed, divide it by the period squared, how much time it takes to go around the square, oh, you get the same number for Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Earth. Wow. But this idea that it travels in ellipses, the books show it this way, and it's like, Really, it took a long time to figure it out. But th those aren't the, that's the way we draw it in the books. So you can see what it means. That's the way it looks in real life. It looks like a circle. They all look like circles. But we draw it this way, and we don't tell people, oh, we're drawing it way out of scale. Don't believe this picture. That's the picture. And that's why it took so long to discover. What I love to think about is it took so long to give up the circles the beautiful, perfect circles of the heaven. And Kepler gives it up and says, ellipses. And what I wonder about is, why does it take so long to give up the idea that the heavens might not be circles? Because the, a priori was like, no, no, the heavens are perfect, circles. And I wonder, as I go through my life, where are the circles that I refuse to give up that I don't even notice? What are the a priori facts that I have that I'm not willing to budge on. Because we have them, but we're not aware of them. That's the idea. No, until somebody points it out, it's like, oh, oh, I never thought of that. So we have Kepler's three laws, and it's a good theory. Why is it a good theory? It's a good theory because observations are consistent with the model, with the theory. We have a theory, we have data, and they both work perfectly together. We need that. It works for the planets, all the planets and the sun. Mercury it works, Mercury and the sun, Venus and the sun, the Mars and the sun, it works for all of them. It also works for the four planets going around Jupiter, the four moons going around Jupiter. The numbers also work. Ah. Uh, and here comes Newton. Galileo dies, Newton is born, and now we have the question of, so how does, how does these Kepler's laws work? How do they work? And Newton says, there must be a force between the sun and each planet. So here's the Earth, here's the sun, they're 93 million miles away, and there's a force that connects them somehow. Now, Newton was not the only one who had this idea. There were many people who understood there must be a force between the planets and the sun. So with or without Newton, we would have solved that problem. But Newton was a genius. And he's, oh, before I tell you what he did here, you know, you meet students in school, in secondary school, in college, and you say, uh, you know, wow, they're really smart. They must be like Newton. No. When you get to college and you study calculus, you work very hard, and there's a big book, and you study every night, and maybe you, if you work really hard and you solve the problems, you get an A in the course, and people say, look how good she is at calculus. She must be so smart. When Newton was her age, he wrote the textbook. He didn't study it, he wrote it. And it's like, oh, that's smart. You know, it's just a different notion of uh, smart and Newton. You know, it's like, um, you know, I, I just always feel this, like, you know, Beethoven, was Beethoven really that extraordinary? Dun -dun -dun, I could have done that. Really, is that hard? Dun -dun -dun -dun, is that that hard to do? Yes, it was very hard to do. <laughs> so what Newton says is, no, it's not just the Earth and the Sun that have this force. The Earth also has the force on an apple. If I let go of an apple, it falls to the ground. Everybody says, yeah, he, Newton's not the first one to see an apple fall to the ground. But Newton saw it differently than everybody else. If I ask you, what happens when an apple falls to the ground, you say, it goes down. Newton said, no, 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 it doesn't go down. It goes toward the center of the Earth. That's different. 
The path looks the same, but it's not going down, it's going to the center of the earth. And then he says, the moon is also going to the center of the earth. It's like, so when's it going to hit? Oh no, it's never going to hit. He has this perverse idea. No, no, the moon is going to the center, but see, it's going this way, and then it comes to the center, then it goes this way, and then it comes to the center, then it goes this way, and then it comes to the center. So it never gets closer to the earth, but it's falling just like the apple. Whew. Okay. So then the moon falls to the earth, the, the, and then Newton, because he's also a mathematical genius, he invents the textbook calculus, he knows that the acceleration on earth is 9.8 meters per second every second. This is a number that Galileo came close to finding. We know that when you drop things, they, they go faster and faster and faster, but always increasing their speed at 9.8 meters per second every second. Newton said, I can find the acceleration of the moon. How do I know the acceleration of the moon? Oh, I know how far the moon is. It's 240,000 miles away, and it takes 28 days to go around, so if I know the speed and I know the distance, I can calculate the acceleration of the moon. Now, it's not a change in speed, it's a change in direction, but there's a way to calculate it. Newton shows us a way to calculate it. And it turns out that it's 0 0.0028 meters per second every second. Not 9.8, 0.0028. But Newton says, you know, it's like the apple. But because it's 60 times further away than the apple, it's going to be 60 times, no, not 60 times less, 60 times 60, or 3,600 times less than the apple. So he takes the apple's number, 9.8, and he divides it by 60 by 60, and he gets 0.0028. Oh my goodness, that's the same as the other calculation. And what happens then is what Bernalski describes in the 1970s. He says, when Newton saw those two numbers, he could hear God thinking. He knew something about the way the world was created that nobody had ever known before. And that would have been good enough. But then Newton goes a step further. He says that not only does the, earth the sun attract the earth and the earth attracts the moon? And the earth attracting the moon, big, that's pretty extraordinary. And the earth attracts the apple in the same way. The apple, the ordinary apple, apple in the earth? And he says, no, it's not just the earth and the apple. An apple and an apple will attract each other. It's like, oh, come on, really? An apple and an apple? So if I put two apples on the table, they're going to hit each other? If the table's flat, I don't think so. But Newton says, no, 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 there's a it's a very small force. It would be very, very hard to measure. But it's the universal law of gravitation. It's gravity for every object that has mass. And I don't care whether it's the sun, the earth, the moon, celestial things, or apples and the earth, or apples and apples. And that's what's extraordinary about what Newton does. And it's a good theory. Why is it a good theory? The observations are consistent with the model. It works for the, plan sun, the planets in the sun and for the planets in the moons. It can explain all three of Kepler's laws with one law, the law of gravity. One instead of three. I like that because I'm not good at remembering. And then we like simplicity. But now the criteria for a good theory changes. It's not enough that Newton's theory does all this. It does more. A good theory now must be able to explain everything the old theory could explain. It should be able to explain things we know about that the old theory could not explain. And then it should be able to predict things that nobody knows about, but then are discovered as the theory predicted they would be. So let's look. Newton's theory, it's a good theory. It can explain everything Kepler's laws could explain. It could explain the paths of all the planets. It could explain, explain all the paths of the moons of Jupiter. It could explain things that everybody knew about, but nobody had any idea. It could explain the orbit of comets. So Edmund Halley went to, went to Newton and said, you know, every once in a while there's this star in the sky we see, and you know, can you predict when it's going to come back? He says, yeah, Newton no, no, says, I can predict that. And he predicts, he says, hey, every 86 years. And Halley says, really? Says, yes. And Halley says, how do you know that? And he says, I, you know, I, I, I developed this thing called calculus, and I do these, you know, I can do this. 
And, and, Kepler, and um, Halley says, will you write it down? And Newton says, I don't have the time. And Halley says, I'll pay you. And so Newton writes the Principia, you know, the important science book. We also know there are two high tides every day. And nobody knew why there were two high tides, but everybody's going out to sea. We know there are two high tides. Anybody who lives near the water knows two high tides. Newton's law of gravitation explains why there are two high tides every day. And it explains why the moon and the earth and the apple are both attracted to the earth with a certain acceleration. But then Newton's law predicts things that nobody knew about. It predicts that an apple and an apple would attract each other. And 150, um, about 85 years later, Cavendish does an experiment in England and shows the two apples attracting one another. He measures it. It's 75 years after Newton dies, but he measured it just like Newton said, and it was exactly like Newton said. Newton said, well, people were so convinced of Newton's laws, Newton's law of gravitation, and they looked at the planet Uranus, and they saw, wait, it's not behaving the way it should. Newton says it should be, go the, in the orbit this way, and it seems to jiggle a little bit. What's going on? Could Newton be wrong? No, no, Newton's not wrong. Maybe there's another planet pulling it a little bit. And they shine the telescopes there and say, we found Neptune. Just like Newton predicted it would be there. That's a good theory. So it's an amazing world after Newton. We understand this clockwork, this majestic clockwork of the solar system, the heavens, everything works according to a perfect plan, Newton's laws. Alexander Pope wrote a poem about it, and one of the lines of the poem was, nature and nature's laws lay hidden night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. <laughs> there was an impact on government and philosophy. When the American Constitution was written, they said equal and opposite forces, that's Newton's laws. So we'll have equal and opposite powers. We'll have separation of powers. We'll have tugs of the, to make sure it's perfect the way the universe is perfect. But Newton's laws didn't work for everything. There were some failures there. The big failure was, OK, OK, Newton. The Earth is attracted to the sun 93 million miles away. How does the sun tell the Earth where it is? How does it send the message? You know, we don't even have to worry about that. How, if I drop, if I drop something right here, if I drop a pen right in front of you, and I let the pen go. With your fingers, show me which way is it going to go? Which way is the pen going to go? It's going to go this way. So the question is, how does the Earth know the pen is here? How does the pen know the Earth is there? Does the, does the Earth send that little thing? Come this way, come this way, little pen. How does it do it? And Newton was aware of this problem and said, hypothesis non finger. I won't even make a hypothesis. This is beyond anything I can understand. That's Newton saying that. I have no idea how the force is transmitted over empty space. There was another problem. Mercury's orbit, way out of scale here, because it's close to a circle, but for an ellipse. It doesn't do the same ellipse. It doesn't do the same ellipse every time. It goes like this, it goes around, and then the next time it goes a little bit this way, then it goes a little bit this way, then it goes, then all of a sudden it's going this way. It precesses, the ellipse precesses. How much does it precess? Well, not that much, two degrees per hundred years. <laughs> really, we measure, yes, we measure that, and it's two degrees every hundred years, it shifts over, and Newton couldn't, couldn't explain that. Shame on Newton. So along comes Einstein. And Einstein, in 1905, um, he's a patent officer. His job is to look at patents and see if they work or not. He's 26 years old. He's not part of the physics community. He loves this job um, because he said, you know what? I work every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all day till 6 o'clock. On Saturdays, I only work till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It leaves me all evenings, Saturday afternoon and Sunday, to do physics. What could be more perfect? And with that job and this 
1905, he writes three papers, each of which would have won the Nobel Prize. Only one can win the Nobel Prize, but all three would have won the Nobel Prize. One was relativity, one was Brownian motion, one was the photoelectric effect. Now, those ideas, the 1905 ideas, even the special relativity about space-time and the distortion of clocks and the distortion of, of meter sticks, other people might have come up with. Poincaré was close, uh, Lorentz was close. And Mark Kack, the mathematician, talks about genius. Because in 1917, Einstein comes up with the general theory of relativity, not the special theory, the general theory. And n everybody agrees nobody would have come up with that. Nobody was even thinking about this. Mark Hack says there are two types of genius. There's one type where, oh yeah, they're really brilliant. But if I had enough time, and you helped me a little bit, I may have been able to do a lot, something like that. Then there's the other type of genius where it's like, never. I never would have been able to do it. I, even after I see it, I can't believe it. No, I can't do it. So that's Einstein's genius. In his general theory of relativity, he says the laws of physics are going to be the same for everyone, and gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. Gravity and acceleration. So if I drop something here, or the room accelerates, I can't tell the difference. That's what Einstein said. Well, I'll explain that. He also said that space is curved by masses. Now, if you're like me, space, this has, this has a shape. I don't even see it. I don't know. It has, space has a shape? And Einstein says, yes, it has a shape, and it's curved. It's like, OK. So let me show what this means. If I take a, a ball, a red ball and a blue ball, um, the color doesn't matter. But if I take two balls, and I let them go. I know after two tenths of a second, the balls are going to fall to here. Even if they're different masses, they're going to go from here to here. Then they're going to go from here to here, because they increase in speed. And then they're going to hit the ground. And they do it the same way. What Einstein realized was that if you're in a spaceship, the balls won't move. Uh, you know, and we have experience with that. When people go up to the space lab for a month, a, a year, or whatever, when there's a nice video on YouTube, you can see of astronauts making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the way they do it is they take the peanut butter out, they take the screw off the top, and they leave it there. Then they get the bread, and then they leave the bread there, and then they go back to, and everything is just floating. There's no table. There's, everything's just there, and they just keep moving it, and they keep making their sandwich, and they just move it. More, more, oh no. When astronauts come back from a year in space, they're so used to this idea. If I put this here, it'll stay there. You know that? So the rule is, when they come back to Earth and they see their family for the first time in one year, do not hand them a baby. <laughs> because they'll take the baby and say, oh, so sweet. And boom. <laughs> because their expectations are not going to fall. So things stay just where they are. But if the rocket ship is accelerated, so even though the, the blue and red balls stay exactly where they are, if the rocket ship is going up, then at the end of 0.2 seconds, it's no longer above my head. It's now at my eye level. And then as the rocket continues to accelerate up, it goes faster. So now it's at my waist level. And then when it accelerates, and then it hits the ground. So, when, so I'm in the spaceship, and I say, oh, it went from here to here to here to the ground. Just like we saw with the object falling. And Einstein said, you can't tell the difference. They're the same. And I know why they're the same. And so his theory explains why they're the same. And it's a good theory. Why is it a good theory? It can explain everything Newton's theory could explain. Pretty good. It can explain things we know about that Newton's theory could not explain. And it could predict things that nobody knows about. But Einstein says, oh no, this would happen. And when we look, we find it. So here we go. It explains what the prior theories could explain. It explains the motion of planets, just like Newton. 
It explains the motion of falling objects on the earth, just like Newton. It explains the attraction of the apples, just like Newton. It also can explain the perturbations of Mercury. Because when you use Einstein's theories and you say, so how much would the procession go? Two degrees every century. Oh my goodness, he gets it right. What about how the force is transmitted from the sun to the earth or from the earth to the pen? Oh, we know how it's transmitted because the space is curved. So because the space is curved, it just moves in the space. Don't worry about the force. The force is incorporated in the bent space. And then he predicts things that nobody knew about. He said, during any light, if it goes by something very massive, it will bend. It'll bend, and I'll tell you how much it will bend. But we can't see the light go by a massive. The sun, that's massive, but you can't see it go by the sun because the sun is so bright. You can't see the stars behind the sun unless there's an eclipse. And when there's a total eclipse of the sun, then the earth gets in the way um, of the shadow, the Earth casts a shadow, and all of a sudden you don't see the sun anymore, and the stars come out in the middle of the day. But they're not the stars, if the eclipse is in June, they're not the June stars, they're the de December stars, because you're looking at the opposite side of the... And he predicts that the light will bend, and Sir Arthur Eddington goes over to the eclipse in Africa a few years after Einstein's theory, and Yes, they bent just the amount Einstein said they would bend, and Einstein becomes very, very famous. So famous that he's a little upset, because he said, you know, when I was a patent officer, I could do my work, and nobody had any expectations for me. Now everybody expects me to come up with something brilliant every day, and I can't do it. He also predicted that if you put clocks up in space, away from the Earth, they would tick slower than the clocks on the Earth. My clock on the Earth goes tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. If you put it in space, it's going to go tick, tock, tick, tock, but not that much slower, like a billionth of a second every hundred years slower, but, but a little bit. And everybody said, very nice, nobody could care less. It's really, that, that much time, who cares? If we didn't take that into account, though, our GPS would no longer work. When they sent the satellites up there, they had a correction. They said, let's just send them up there. And they said, they're not working. OK, turn on the general relativity Einstein correction. And then boom, they all worked. So that was predicted. And then he predicted there, were things, there would be things like black holes, things which bent the space so much that light couldn't exist. And you would never see them. It's like, and we know black holes exist. Wait, how do we know they exist if you can't see them? We can see things orbiting nothing. And we say, there's a black hole there. And finally, he predicted there would be gravitational waves. If you took massive objects and you move the massive object, then this massive object moving would actually have to distort space all across. Space would have to distort. And the way it distorts is it distorts in the local neighborhood, then, the, then has to distort here, 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 because everything is changing. And so a gravitational wave would be emitted. But no, you're not going to be able to measure that, because you have to, first of all, get big objects to move. They have to move fast. They have to move suddenly. And what are the chances? Well, we built LIGO to measure it. We said, if an event happens where two massive objects collide, then there will be a gravitational wave. It will reach the Earth, and it will change space by one billion, well, about a hundredth the size of a proton. A proton. Now, you know, we don't have any sense of uh, atoms, so let me give you a sense. So I, I wear this gold ring. Um, and, you know, occasionally I tap it on things like, every time I tap this gold ring, about a million atoms fall off. <laughs> a million atoms of gold. That's an atom. 
an atom is much, an atom of gold has 79 protons and another 80 neutrons. So think, in an atom of gold, and millions just fell off, there are many, many protons, and the space ripple that, that is going to be less than the size of one of those. And there were these people who said, I think we can measure that. It was like, really? Yeah, I think we can measure it. So we, we've had, for the past 100 years or so, 150 years, ways of measuring very small distances called an interferometer. In the interferometer, the laser shines, and it goes, some of the path of the laser goes le up, down, and others go left, right, and then the two beams join. And if they join one way, you get the light. If you join the other way, the light gets dimmer. And so you can measure very small distances with this. And there, we built the detectors, LIGO. Those are big interferometer arms, miles long. But the laser goes back and forth. And the, if a gravitational wave comes, you will notice a shift. Because one of them will get a tiny bit shorter, and one will get a tiny bit longer. But we don't build it in one place. Because if you build it in one place, and somebody goes like that against a table, it'll jiggle. The, the detector will jiggle. It's a proton. The, the, if you just go like. I, I'm going to make that whole LIGO thing jiggle. So you build it in two different places, 1,500 miles apart. So if you go like this, this one jiggles, that one doesn't. But if they both jiggle the exact same way, you say, OK, this is not somebody stepping on the table. And that's what happened. So we discovered the gravitational waves of two black holes, one 20 times as big as the sun, the other about 20 times as big as the sun, and they merged and collided, and they sent out this ripple across space, and we detected it on September 14th in 2015. Now, the event, when these two black holes came together, this event was a billion years ago. Now, that's 1,100 1, million years ago. So I want to give you a sense of that number. Here's 1,100 million years ago. The black holes collided. There's the Earth. That, oh, what's happening on Earth? Oh, we have complex cells for the first time. <laughs> then that gravitational ripple is moving, and only 500, 500 million years, it's now only 500 million years away. I can't wait. And now on Earth, we have our first fish. Then, it's now only 250 million light years away, and on Earth, we have our first reptiles. 65 million years ago on Earth, we have our first dinosaurs. It's coming, it's coming. Then, uh, 10 million years ago, we have our first chimpanzees, and then 500,000 years ago, Neanderthals are on the Earth. And then, 100,000 years ago, the first human beings, the first human speech. We're finally learning how to talk 100,000 years ago. Five Thousand years ago, oh, I'm getting so excited now. Five thousand years ago, look, it's it's almost there. That gravitational ripple, it's coming. It's it's it really, it's going to be here in only five thousand years. And on Earth, we have our first written language. Twenty-five hundred years ago, we have our first literature. It happens to be Tamil literature, which is nice because here we are in Bangalore. Then 500 years ago, it's, it's really, it's almost here, 500 years ago, Galileo and Newton are born. <laughs> we invent physics. Then 100 years ago, we don't know this is coming. We have no idea this is coming, but it's coming. And Einstein invents his theory of general relativity. And then 30 years ago, LIGO, some scientists say, can we have some money to build this detector in case something comes our way? And 20 years ago, they begin the site construction. And it takes about 20 years to build it. And here it is. It's about to be built at the cost of $1,100 million and US dollars. And the gravitational waves, the LIGO is ready. It's like, OK. Let's start observing. And then right after we do that, one month later, it hits. The gravitational ripple hits. And everybody says, this is amazing. And some of the people say, I don't even believe it. 
you know, what luck. You know, we finally got this thing built, and it detects the gravity. Yeah, really? Really? Um, the world is told in February, everybody is just so excited by this. And then, that's February. In December, we see another one. It's like, it happened again? Then on January 4th, we get another third, a third one, another set of black holes clients like, they're doing this all the time. We had no idea. And the space keeps extending. And then on August 14th, we have another merger of black holes, but now it's not just the two LIGOs. Virgo, which is in, Ca which is in Pisa, Italy, has just come on board. It's just another interferometer. It's 4,000 miles away from the other two. And they say, yep, we noticed it too. So now three observatories are measuring. And then the big event. On August 17th, 2017, only four months ago, LIGO observed not the merger of two black holes, which just makes gravitational waves, but the merger of two neutron stars. Neutron stars we can see. And when they merge, they produce the ripple of gravitational waves, but they also produce gamma ray bursts, and infrared bursts, and ultraviolet bursts, and visible light. And every single telescope on Earth looks up in the sky and says, we just saw the infrared, we just saw the gamma ray, we saw the visible light. And now we know not only that the gravitational wave detectors are real, we also know that neutron stars can collide, and this is where our gold and our platinum comes from, because nobody quite knew that. We had a theory about it, but now we see it's happening. That's where all the heavy elements come from. And we now know that gravitational waves travel at the same speed as light. Because if they traveled slower than light, you, would have, you wouldn't have seen them. You saw the gravitational waves at the same time you saw the light. And so we now know something more about gravitational waves we knew from the black holes. And now, as of August, a new era of multi-messenger astronomy, gravitational waves, um, breakthrough of the year in Science Magazine, Nobel Prize in physics. This is big stuff. This is big stuff. And so we have that. I tried to give you a sense of what 2,500 years means, uh, what, what 1.1 billion years means. And I don't think I did a good enough job of what one point, um, a good enough job of what 1.1 billion years ago. And so I searched the literature and I said, somebody must have done better than me at describing 1.1 billion years. And I realized, oh yeah, Vishnu and Narada, they explained it. So there's a story in Hindu mythology about Vishnu and Narada, Narada. And Narada goes over to Vishnu, and he says, you know, I've followed you my whole life. And Vishnu says, I know. And he says, can you do me one favor? And, and um, Vishnu says, what is it? And Narada says, I would like you to tell me the secret of Maya. What is the meaning of Maya? And Vishnu says, I can do that. But let's go for a walk first. So they go for a walk. And they go for this walk, and they're walking and walking. And then all of a sudden, Vishnu gets a little tired. And he says, you know, I have to rest here for just a moment. And there's a stream down there. Can you get me some water from the stream? And Narada says, sure. And he goes down to the stream. When he gets to the stream, there's this beautiful woman who's getting water for And he looks at her, and their eyes meet, and something happens. And he follows her back to the village. And it's as if the villagers all expected him to come. And there's something going on here, but he feels quite, quite at home at the village, and he stays in the village, and after some years, he marries the woman, and he farms the land, and then they have children, and they have a very happy life. And then one day, the monsoon comes, a terrible flood, a terrible monsoon. And Narada is trying to save his family. He has his wife with one arm. He has his two children with the other hand. He has his third child, the baby, on his shoulders. And the waters come, and the baby gets ripped from his shoulders. And he goes to grab the baby, and then he loses his two children. And then he goes for children, and he loses his wife. He's lost everything. He's drowning himself and becomes unconscious. And he wakes up, 
And he looks, and there's Vishnu saying, have you gotten me my water yet? That's the secret of Maya. Vishnu and Eastern philosophy is trying to communicate big times and showing us how difficult it is to understand big times. It's hard enough for me to understand 50 years, 20 years, 10 years. 15 years is hard for you to understand. So that's what we need. We need little ways of helping us with that. So the way the scientific revolutions work is there's a present theory, then you have dissatisfaction with the present theory, and then you need a new theory. The new theory has to explain what the old theories could, explain something the old theory could not, predict something new. And in science education, when we tell these stories, when we teach about science, we have to communicate this excitement. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We have to also have a better approach to teaching. So in active physics, we have this problem-based learning. So students are given a project to do, like design a roller coaster for riders. You're going to design a roller coaster. How do you design a roller coaster? What, do you what physics do you have to know so when the people go upside down, they don't fall out? So you present the design, and the students provide the safety data, and they analyze this. So these would be the physics things they would learn about velocity and acceleration, gravitational potential energy, Newton's law of gravity, and Hooke's law, right? all of this stuff, and forces during acceleration. And when we teach forces during acceleration, when we teach any of those concepts, we use a 7E instructional model. We want to engage the students. We want to elicit their prior understandings. We want to have them explore the phenomena, explain the phenomena, then we can elaborate and put it in a larger context and extend, and all the time we want to evaluate it. So let me give you an example of this. We ask students, if you get in an elevator, and you happen to have a bathroom scale with you, and you put the bathroom scale on the, on the elevator floor and you step on it. I, I think most of you have done this. And you press the button and the elevator go up. Will the, ele will the weight stay the same? Will you get heavier or will you get lighter? So let me just have a quick vote. You get heavier, you stay the same, or you, oh, no, I'm sorry, heavier, heavier. You get, um, oh, no, heavier, more weight. You'd stay the same or you get lighter when you press the button. Let me see the, some, uh, let me see how you're doing here. Heavier, the same, lighter. Exactly, yeah, take your, take your hand out of the, I want to see the thumbs, come on. Okay, okay. So we asked the students that, and they also have different answers about what's going to happen. So we then say, oh, so you don't all agree on what's going to happen. That's interesting. Let's do an exploration. And so we ask students to take a weight and put the weight, hang the weight from a spring scale. And I can see how much it weighs. If it weighed more, it would go deeper. If it weighed less, it would go like this. And you'll notice that when I lift it up at a constant speed, it weighs exactly the same. Now, of course, when I start it, it weighs a little more. When I stop it, it weighs a little less. But when it's coming up at a constant speed, oh, it stays the same. It's like, well, no, it's going up. Shouldn't it be just a little bit more? No. A little bit. Maybe we can't say. No. And so then, after the students do that, we ask the students to explain this to us. What did they observe? What happened in the experiment? What would happen in an elevator? Why does it weigh the same? Why does it weigh more? Or why does it weigh less? And then we extend the discussion to more interesting things like acceleration and gravity, as we talked about before. And then we evaluate the students. We say, what does it mean? How do you know? Can, why do you believe? Why should I care about this? And we have other evaluation questions which say, how do you measure this? What do you do? And how does it relate to science? But the 70 instructional model is a good model, and it's a good way to instruct it, and it makes your lessons better. So the question is, can the nature of science inform science education? So here we have the nature of science, which we spent most of our time talking about. And then we have our models for high-quality science instruction, like the 7E model, which is one of the models. In science, we have a present theory. And you have to have dissatisfaction with the theory. Well, look at this. 
When I elicit your understandings, does it get heavier, stay the same, or get lighter? I'm trying to find out what you know. And I'm trying to find out what is your present theory about how these scales work, how weight works. I'm trying to find out what is your present theory. And then, after that, I'm going to do an activity with you. So the what do you think tells me what you, your theory is. And then I'm going to have you do the experiment. And all of a sudden, some of you are going to say, it got heavy. It didn't get heavy. Wait, uh, 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 I don't like my theory. My theory isn't as good as I thought it was. Because whatever we try to teach, our students have a theory for. Before they walk into class, they have a theory. And we have to find out what that theory is. And then we have to say, it's not that good a theory. Let me show you why. And so now they do an experiment. And they say, oh, yeah, look at that. Wow, that's not what I thought. And then we can have them explain to us the new theory. We have a new theory about why this works, why you would get heavier, why you wouldn't get heavier. And that new theory is part of the explain. And so now they have a new theory, and they have to say, is it good? Does the new theory help us to explain everything the old theory could explain? Does it satisfy me? Because if it doesn't satisfy me, I'm going back to my old theory. But we want to satisfy people. And then we can say, does it, does it explain something the old theory could not? And that's the elaboration. It's like, yes, we can now explain why the book doesn't weigh more or less. And then we can explain something else as well. So we also have another way to look at science in terms of three-dimensional learning, the content, the practices, the cross-cutting concepts. And once again, the four essential questions can make parallels here. So the idea is that, as I said, Everybody has a theory about how the world works. One of my favorite things to do when I'm at the airport is I sit there, and there are two-year-olds. They're two years old. And you've seen them. They walk around. You know, there's no traffic. They're walking around. They're going around. They're jumping. They're doing this. They're touching. They own the world. They've been here two years, and they got this place nailed. They just know the world. And you just, they have such confidence about where they are and what they're doing, and they touch things, and they jump up, and they run around. And occasionally, something strange happens. They run to their mother. But for the most part, they're feeling, they have theories about the world. They're feeling very comfortable. The students we deal with who might be 8 years old or 10 years old or 15 years old or 20 years old, oh, they have theories, and they are really locked in deep down. So we have to, first of all, say, what's your theory? So here. The weight in an elevator, that was your theory. Let me ask you another one. If I look at a, I have a mirror, and the mirror, I look at the mirror, and the mirror goes from here to here. I can see from my eyebrows to my chin. I say, oh, you know, I'd like to see more of my face. What is your theory? What should I do to see more of my face? Move it further back. When you get home tonight, take a mirror, move it further back, Nope, you won't see any more of your face. And they say, maybe I didn't move further back enough, so put the mirror on the wall. <laughs> say, okay, I can see from here to here. <laughs> you will not see more of yourself. Now you say, oh, yes, I would. No, your theory is wrong. And now you might be ready to want to change your theory. How about this one? You have a yellow balloon and a blue balloon. The yellow balloon is little. They're the same kind of balloon, but this one's only blown up a little bit. This one's blown up a lot. And I'm holding the two balloons, and there's a little tube connecting them. And I'm holding the balloons so the air can't go back and forth. But now I'm going to let go so the air can go back and forth. So there are a number of things that can happen. Either they will become equal, or the yellow balloon will get smaller, or the yellow balloon will get bigger. I think those are the only possibilities. The yellow balloon gets smaller, and the blue balloon gets bigger. The yellow balloon stays the same, and the blue balloon stays the same, even though the air can move back and forth. Or the yellow balloon gets bigger, and the blue balloon gets smaller until they're like the same. Let's see what your theories are. 
the yellow balloon. Bigger, the same, or smaller? Let me see. Let me... Is everybody voting? Uh, come on, vote. Vote. You gotta, you gotta vote. Even if you don't know what I'm doing, put your thumb this way, this way, or this way. You gotta you got vote. You got, you're part of my class. Everybody in my class votes. Come on. Let me see the votes. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's hard for everybody to see. I can see. So I want you all, it's about a third, a third. I want you to see. How many people, just stand up for a moment, think the yellow balloon gets bigger? Stand up. Just stand up. Right. Look around at all those people with that theory. Okay, sit down. How many people think it stays the same? Stand up. Oh, look at that. Sit down. How many people think the yellow balloon gets smaller? Stand up. Ooh. All those people. Now, this is not a democracy. <laughs> it's not whoever had the most people standing wins. We can do the experiment. But now, I'm excited about this experiment because you're all fighting with one another. Oh no, it's going to get bigger. No, it's going to get smaller. No, it's going to stay the same. We have three very different theories, and within those theories, I bet there are other reasons why they get the same, or why one gets bigger, or why one... So if we had a discussion, about, no, no, it gets bigger for this reason. No, no, it gets bigger for that reason. No, it gets bigger for this... So we have multiple... But you can't even decide on what happens. Now we're ready to go to class. Now we're ready to have instruction. Now we're ready to learn. And then the seasons. If you ask most thinking people, why is it colder in the winter? They'll say the Earth is further away. It's not true. Nehru. Nehru defined something called the, science, the scientific uh, uh, temper of science. He wrote in the discovery of India in, five, um, in 1946, what is needed is the scientific approach, the adventurous and yet critical temper of science the search for truth and new knowledge, the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial, the capacity to change previous conclusions in the face of new evidence, the reliance on observed fact and not on preconceived theory, the hard discipline of the mind. All this, this is necessary, but not merely for the application of science, but for life itself and the solution of its many problems. It's in your constitution. It's not in our constitution, it's in your constitution. It shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. And the question is, how do we do it? And the answer is through education. That's the future of India, education. Thank you.